Miles, uh, co-founder of the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics, and I am here with uh, a, a co-co-founder of the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics, Daniel Geffrick. Uh, Daniel is the teaching pastor at Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana, and he teaches with Tyndale Theological Seminary, Calvary University, Word of Life Bible Institutes, plural, around the world. Uh, yeah. This guy is a, a world traveler and teacher. He's an author of multiple books, articles. Uh, he's contributed to multi-Arthur books. And uh, he is contributing a chapter on the image of God in man to an upcoming book on hell. And since the ISBH webinar topic is hell he will be presenting that chapter today that was a that's a long introduction you're a busy man <laughs> that's a lot yeah that's a lot and it makes me sound a whole lot more important than i really am so that's you know <laughs> i don't think any of us is that important <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate your your expertise on this uh topic and and bringing it to the table here so what is well, this uh this book that's coming up what are you uh uh, what are you contributing? What's going on there? Well, yeah. So um, a friend of mine, Keith Sherlin, uh, down in South Carolina, um, he is uh, he's really invested in this this debate that is growing in um, the the modern church uh, evangelicalism on is basically what's the nature of hell. Is it going to be, as has been taught for so many you know, centuries, eternal conscious torment of unbelievers, mm -hmm. or is there um, what's known as conditional immortality, where immortality will be given only to believers and unbelievers will go to the lake of fire and then eventually, and the, the amount of time is not uh, necessarily you know, d defined, but eventually be consumed. And they will go out, not just separated from God, like we'll be talking about today in our, you know, multiple sessions, but actually go out of existence completely. And so death then becomes a uh, linked to existence rather than relationship. So uh, there are, last I knew, there were like 30 different contributors to this book. Mm -hmm. I just have one small chapter, um, but that shows how big of a deal it is. And um, so I'm really excited. I know there's still a long way to go. It's not like the book is coming out next month or anything, um, but it, you know, we'll definitely keep our ISBH uh, members and um, uh, friends uh, apprised on when this book is available. So... Um, this chapter, this uh, my chapter is on the image of God when it comes to the doctrine of hell, and uh, so that's that's what I'll be you know sharing about today as we talk as we think about some of this stuff. So, great. Well, I look forward to uh, to hearing you out. So uh, I'll turn it over to you now and uh, see if All I right. can flip well, over the the view around. There you go. Okay. Let her rip, Tater Tip. <laughs> All right. Well, I really appreciate it, Paul. It's it's uh, it's great to work with you with the ISBH and and other things that, that you and I have worked on together. Um, so uh, it's good to be here with you this morning and and all of our friends. Um, uh, just a thought before we we get started. I know we have four sessions today, and uh, we're we're approaching this from different angles. And the reason that that is important is because there there is no you know single single passage. There's no one verse. There's no silver bullet that if we had, we could just say, aha, eternal conscious torment is, this proves it forever and nobody can uh, can disagree with it. The fact that there is a disagreement, the fact that the this, this disagreement is growing, sadly, actually, um, proves that the, the silver bullet concept is not uh, not here. What we're going to present today in our various our speakers, the ministries that will be uh, represented today, the churches that will be represented today, all come at the scriptures from a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. This is exactly what ISBH presents, teaches, holds to. And so we're going to handle the scriptures as carefully and accurately as we can. 
so that all these perspectives, and again, this, this book I was mentioning has, you know, upwards to about 30 contributors, lots of different angles and perspectives coming at the same point. So it's not like we're just going to have one session and there it is that just solves it for everybody. These are several things that we need to think about and put them all together in the big package. So mine is on the image, mine is on the image of God and how it relates to the doctrine of hell. It's, you know, Orthodox Christianity. Let me let me set up this doctrine a little bit because this is the first session. Orthodox Christianity has all always believed in a final judgment for both the righteous and the wicked, right? Um, the existence of hell as the method and the place of punishment for the wicked has remained relatively untouched, except for a handful of fringe beliefs like universalism, right? The concept that God's love will eventually overcome all human rejection with the result that everyone will eventually be saved. Uh, this has been held and taught off and on throughout the centuries, you know, about a dozen years ago, uh, Rob Bell's book, Love Wins, really caught a lot of flack from conservatives because that's exactly what it taught. Is that God's love will win in the end and overcome any rejection. Uh, another thought is or concept is called conditional immortality, like we were just talking about. The belief that only the saved, only believers, the redeemed, the righteous, whatever term you want to use, will receive immortality. So you and I do not have immortality right now. It would be wrong in this system to, to call ourselves immortal. That is something that we would gain in the future and live forever, while unbelievers will not gain that. Okay, it's not a major concept within historic Christianity, but it has had some followers, and I would say, sadly, it has seen a resurgence in uh, in recent times. What my article, my chapter for this book, and what my presentation today is going to try to explore is how the doctrine of imago dei, right, the image of God in humanity, intersects with the doctrine of hell. OK, in other words, does the image of God fit better with the doctrine of eternal conscious torment of unbelievers or conditional immortality and then their ultimate uh, annihilation? Well, uh, in order to do this, we'll spend more time on the image of God itself and, and death and everything and then try to wrap it up at the end when it comes into the doctrine of hell. So the starting point obviously has to be the image of God itself, right? What is it? Who has it? Uh, can it be lost, damaged, negatively impacted? What, what are all of those? The definitive passage, of course, is found really on the first page of most of our Bibles, the first page of text anyway. At the end of the creation week, uh, what I would consider the pinnacle of God's creative imagination and power, God brought into existence humanity. Uh, this is Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 from the New American Standard uh, 2020 edition. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice a couple of important details in this account. First, humanity was created in God's image according to God's likeness. So, whatever this means in its entirety, and there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion. People have written and studied on this for centuries, millennia, really. And so I'm not saying that this is the definitive, <laughs> um, uh, you know, definitive scholarly opinion or anything. Uh, we're trying to explore one piece of it. But whatever it means in its entirety, we have to understand that the image of God has an element of divinity. Okay, not deity. We're not gods. That was part of uh, Satan's lie to them. You will be like gods. So not not 
not deity, but there is uh, there's a, a distinction, I think, and, and others do as well, between divinity and uh, deity. And so I think inherent to the image of God, there is some divinity, but not deity. God, here's another way to put it, God has placed something of himself in us, but not, you know, again, to make us gods. Secondly, whatever humanity is, as defined throughout the rest of scripture, and especially here in, in Genesis 1 and 2, God has divided humanity into two genders, male and female. Now, that could go off in a completely different topic, especially given our culture today. But where I want to bring that is that even though we were created in different ways and in at different times, based on the more detailed description in Genesis 2, and no matter our other differences, because, you know, men and women are different, both men and women are God's image and carry his likeness. It's not just like, uh, you know, man is the image of God and woman is not. I know 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the glory of man and woman and everything, but as far as the image and likeness is concerned, there's no difference, male and female. We both, in the image of God, he created humanity, mankind, male and female, he created them. So the words image and likeness have caused difficulty. Uh, and you may know this, so uh, those of you watching live or, or, or watching this recording later on, there's been a lot of difficulty for Bible scholars and teachers for a long time, centuries. Many of us, and I'm going to just wrap us all together, many of us humans assume that God has no physical form of any kind. And this is often based on John 4, 24, God is spirit right? Verses like Colossians 1.15 and, and 1 Timothy 1.17, where he's described as invisible. Throughout the scriptures, though, we have numerous passages where God is said to have a face, eyes, feet, hands, ears, uh, a mouth. Uh, Psalm 89, for instance, has several of these references all packed together in one place. But these are often dismissed as um, anthropomorphic, uh, just human descriptions that are designed to help us understand and relate to God better. I'm going to argue that I think that that is a big assumption, okay? When God, or when John rather wrote, no one has seen God at any time, John 1.18, he was necessarily referring to humans, right? Angels, and others stand in his presence, see him, converse with him regularly. Think of Job, chapters 1 and 2. The sons of God came to present themselves to him. He talked with them. They talked with him. They carried on a conversation. Okay, 1 Kings 22, we have the scene in heaven where angels are sitting around the throne room and God is conversing with them about the, uh, the events that are happening on the earth. Revelation chapter 4. Again, in the throne room, we have the, the living creatures, we have the elders, we have angels, we have John in a vision, and they are interacting and listening to and talking to God. Before Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb and, and actually took on the fullness of humanity, the eternal Son of God often met with fallen humans, talked with them even ate with them. One of my favorite passages in Genesis is chapter 18, where the angel of the Lord and, and Jesus and, and, and two angels came by Abraham's tent, Abram's house, to, uh, to have lunch. <laughs> God just showed up to have lunch with his friend. And I think that's amazing. But that means that they had lunch. They ate. They drank. They talked. They sat. They stood. In the next chapter, we have the angels coming down to the city of Sodom, grabbing Lot, his wife, and his daughters by their hands and dragging them out of the city. Okay? And so there is physical connection. Do they just assume a human form? Do they embody or do they embody something? Or do they have a kind of body? Um, this, I think, does play into our understanding of image and likeness. Uh, we assume angels have no physical bodies because of verses like Hebrews 
where they are uh, ministering spirits sent out to, uh, to serve those who are going to uh, obtain or inherit or gain salvation. And they have done um, all of the same physical things, uh, like I said there in Genesis 18 and 19. They even uh, have a realm in which they can do battle and be stopped, be hindered, prohibited from advancing, moving forward. So they have limitations and constraints similar to us, but obviously on a different level. We see this in Daniel chapter 10, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, the the archangel Michael, uh, one of the leading princes, had to come help the messenger angel because he was being stopped in that realm, in that dimension. So I think the explanation that um, God and angels simply appear as humans or take human form, I'm not sure that that quite cuts it, okay? At least in my mind, it doesn't. But it does lead to, um, I think, two important questions. First, why would appearing as a human be more advantageous than actually having a form that can interact both inside and outside of our finite dimensional world? And so that's more of the a question about them. A question, secondly, more about us is why do we as humans assume or tend to assume that when something is invisible to our eyes, it necessarily means that it has no body or form at all? <laughs> is our 3D world the only realm that can... can uh, constitute a physical existence? Uh, the science over the the, uh, the centuries and the millennia has proven to us that there are so many things that we cannot see with the human eye, with the naked eye. There's light that we cannot see. There are, there are particles that are too small or there are things too far away or there's all sorts of things that we can't see. And many times we assumed wrongly that they did not exist until proven otherwise. I think that might be helpful here. Uh, in fact, we talk about God in a sense of outside of time, right? L not limited by time. And when we do that, we are implicitly admitting that he exists in a dimension outside of ours. And so if we're going to make assumptions anyway, God is spirit. Therefore, there's no form, no physicality, no anything. Angels are ministering spirits. Therefore, there's no physicality. What if we add an assumption? that um, maybe they do have a form, uh, but it's one that's not limited to this three-dimensional structure in which we live, this finite, uh, earthbound, terrestrial structure in which we live. Um, I love uh, C.S. Lewis. I love reading him. He's a great thinker. Of course, don't agree with all of his theological conclusions, but I love reading his fiction as well, The Chronicles of Narnia. Arnia, out of the silent planet as part of the space trilogy is really interesting because he tries to explain or describe angels. Uh, he made up the term or used the term Eldilla uh, to describe them in such a way that helps bring balance to this, this, uh, this ethereal, non-terrestrial, and yet somehow corporeal bodily form that they may have. And so um, one creature was describing to a human who could not see these things, these angels. He said, the Eldilla are hard to see. They're not like us. Light goes through them. You must be looking in the right place at the right time, and that's not likely to come about unless one of them wishes to be seen. Sometimes you can mistake them for a sunbeam or, or even a moving of the leaves, but when you look again, you see that it was an Eldil and that it's gone. But whether your eyes, human, can ever see them, you know, I don't know. But later in the series, the human was able to see them. Uh, with time and practice, and of course, with their permission. But what the point is, is that their form, which was different than the humans, different than the, the other creatures, but this form allowed them to transverse space and time with almost no limitation, at least certainly not the ones we face. They were able to jump from one planet to another and from heaven to earth almost instantaneously. And I understand that Lewis, this, this is a fictional work, right? I, I, I get that this is his, you know, his somewhat of a fantasy or his understanding, but it was his attempt to explain how something can have a real form that is not limited to what we experience as physical, okay? And we need thinkers like Lewis because it's easy for us 
to simply disbelieve what we can't see or don't understand. So how does this relate to the image of God and then ultimately hell? Well, it comes back to the two key words of Genesis 1, image and likeness. The Hebrew word translated image is selim, and it occurs only 17 times in the Hebrew scriptures, and it refers to an image or a statue or an idol, a figurine, or even a picture that is drawn on a wall. Uh, and possibly a shadow as well. Uh, it was most commonly translated in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, or the Hebrew scriptures rather, by ekon, which is where we get our word icon, and eidolon, which is where we get our word idol. Okay, so both the Hebrew and the Greek words indicate a visible representation of something else, a replica by which the viewer should be able to recognize the real thing. I'm from the Midwest in the United States, and so we have certain phrases in the Midwest and, and in the South here that uh, you know definitely uh, help bring some of these out, even if not exactly what you would consider you know a theological phrase. We still hear this concept show up is using this term image when somebody refers to a child as you're the spitting image of your, your father, your grandfather, your mom, your, whatever. You're the spitting image. The concept is that this child or this person is so uncannily similar to this other person that you can't look at the child, for instance, without seeing the ancestor no matter how far back it was. And, and we still see this today. You know, there's a person and you look at the picture of a great, 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 great grandparent. And it's like, wow, look how similar they are. That's the idea, I think, of what's going on here. The human race, humans are supposed to be, or God is supposed to be able to be recognized by looking at humans. The Hebrew word translated likeness is demut which occurs only 25 times in the Hebrew text, but it is overwhelmingly, like 20 out of 25, translated in the Septuagint with homoi oma and homoiosis, uh, this homo concept, this likeness concept, both of which have to do with the idea of similarity, okay, or likeness. More than half of the uses of demut are found in Ezekiel 1 and 10, where Ezekiel is attempting to describe the cherubim, uh, the heavenly throne room, and even God himself as he sits on the throne. And some of the best uh, words that he could choose are, well, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. Uh, John did a similar thing in the Revelation chapter, uh, nine, or chapter 9, where he said it was like, 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 like. It's not that it was exact. He's just trying to bring across uh, the concept based on characteristics, Okay. And so the imperfect explanations of what the reality was like in Ezekiel sets up actually the throne room in John or in Revelation 4 that John saw as well. So when we bring these concepts together with these, these Hebrew words, image is the, rep, uh, the replication of one thing into another form usually imperfect and you know less than identical. We're again, we're not God, but we are in his image. Likeness seems to focus less on the replication and more on the characteristics or the description of the reality. So to say that humanity was created in God's image according to God's likeness is to say that God gave to us some of his physical, and I'll put that in air quotes, his physical attributes, obviously you know, dumbed down into this three-dimensional finite uh, terrestrial realm, but enough that those who have seen him can recognize him in us. And enough of his characteristics, or a lot of times we call them attributes, so that we can accurately represent him to all observers as we carry out his work in this world. So I don't think it's quite enough to say that we simply bear his image. I think we actually are his image. We are the images of God in this realm. And we see this with Jesus when he became human, when he took on humanity. He is 
the image of the invisible God. I would say the perfect image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. And he is the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1.3, both image and likeness perfectly in Jesus. And that's important because he is the one, according to Romans 8.29, that God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. So Jesus is the perfect representation, the perfect image and likeness of God. And we are to be conformed to that image as we um, uh, present God to this world. So Jesus presents and represents God so perfectly that one time he even told the apostles, whoever has seen me, the one who has seen me, has seen the father, right? John 14, verse nine. So God's goal for us is to shape us in such a way, conform us in such a way, so that once again, we can be his perfect image and representation. Now, even though he's designed and created us exactly the way he wants us, but bestowed on us his blessing and the work of ruling his creation there in Genesis 1, something changed when we sinned. Okay, we were supposed to serve, uh, quoting the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, as God's viceroy, representative, or witness among the creatures. But we chose to serve ourselves, and ultimately Satan, instead. When God accused Adam, saying, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, in Genesis 3, the implication, I think, was, instead of me, you listened to her instead of listening to me. And so the punishment for this act of defiance had already been announced in Genesis 2.17. On the day that you eat from it, the forbidden tree, you will certainly die. The use of the infinitive absolute there in the Hebrew text, followed by the imperfect form of the same verb, mot de, uh, tamut, gives an intense certainty to the result. You will most certainly die. The translations that say you will surely die are trying to bring across what's there in the Hebrew text. Whatever death meant, and it's not yet defined yet, it's not yet defined in, in Genesis 2, there was no doubt in Adam's mind that that was the guaranteed result should he choose to reject God's instructions. This promised death was clearly not just physical demise because Adam lived for a total of 930 years. And the death promised by God was to occur on the day that Adam ate the fruit of the tree. Now, some scholars have tried to prove that the phrase on the day does not have to mean that exact day or that exact moment. But out of the 33 times that the phrase occurs in Genesis, 21 of them refer to that literal day or the immediate time, you know, at that time on that day. Only 10 times does it refer to a broader period, but in each case, that is clearly described in the context, usually along the lines of, in the days of you know, Noah, in the days of Abraham, that sort of thing. And then the other two don't fit either context, uh, uses like, you know, by day or by night, you know, on, on the day, on, on the night. So the overwhelming, you know, about two thirds have to do with the immediate time. And in fact, we find that phrase four times before Genesis 2. And that helps set the intended meaning. One of those is the by day or by night, but the other three fit into the immediate time. Okay. Um, Genesis 2 2 on the seventh day, so a very specific time. And then Genesis 2 4 twice, it says, on the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. So it's talking about at that moment, at the time of creation. So the normal expected meaning points to Adam's death occurring within a relatively short period, immediately following his disobedience. And Satan understood the same thing. This was He knew that's what the meaning was, because when he finally stopped questioning God's word and began to blatantly contradict it, he used the same phrase. God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll become like God, knowing good and evil. So what was this death that happened on the day at the moment? It's not physical death, because that did not happen until 930 years later. But something did happen. In fact, three things happened. First, we're told the eyes of them, of the eyes of both of them were opened. 
that's clearly spiritual. It wasn't physical because like just a few seconds earlier, they were standing there looking at the tree, looking at each other, looking at the serpent with their physical eyes. Okay. So the eye opening is a spiritual result of death, not a, not a physical thing. And uh, it's further described with two phrases. They knew that they were naked and knowing both good and evil. So there's this effect, this a spiritual effect. A second spiritual effect was that when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So in, in addition to a negative spiritual effect on their knowledge, there was also a new effect on their relationship with God. Previously, God and humanity, at least God and Adam, had talked, they had conversed, they seemed to have a good relationship. Immediately on their disobedience, that relationship changed to the extent that they ran away and hid when they heard God coming in their direction, instantaneous on the day that they ate the fruit. The third spiritual result was that Adam and Eve both lied about what had taken place, and they shifted the blame to someone else. Oh, the serpent deceived me, Eve said. Adam actually went so far as to blame God himself, right? Um, the woman whom you gave me, I would have been better off without her. So that describes or represents a further distancing. Now they have a not just a distant relationship, not just a separation from God in their, their relationship, but now they're actually lying, blame-shifting, Oh, I was hiding because I was naked. Come on, there's something else going on. Of course, God knew that, but there's something else going on there. And they're not showing any remorse for their sin. Ultimately, the result of their willful disobedience was the expulsion from God's presence and the direct, unimpeded access that they had previously enjoyed. Okay, so the death that God promised Adam in Genesis 2.17, on that day you will most certainly die, was not physical. That was added later in Genesis 3.19, you'll return to dust because that's from where you came. But that wasn't what God said, in the day you eat, you will certainly die. That's a spiritual thing. It has nothing to do with physical existence, physical uh, 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 cessation or, or, or non-cessation. Okay. And so what we find as we learn more and more in the scriptures about sin and about our fallen human nature, we don't find that description change. In fact, what we find is that this death, usually called spiritual death to help distinguish it from physical death, is exactly how the biblical writers envision our natural state. Throughout human history, it's in this state in which we are born and we live and we die when we're without Christ, in dead in our trespasses and sins. Not physical, has no concept. Physical is not including. So a biblical understanding of death, then, is not the cessation of existence, but a separation, a rift in a previous relationship. Life, in fact, is the opposite, a relationship of, or a bringing together of two things or two people. Paul regularly used the words in this way. In Romans 6, he says, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Nobody says that when we are dead to sin, anything ceases to exist, but the relationship is broken, has changed. Jesus defined eternal life for us in John 17. He said, this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That has nothing to do with living forever, immortality, existence, breath, anything. Okay? And we can see this all throughout the Old and the New Testaments. And it makes sense because God himself is life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Paul could say that unbelievers are excluded from the life of God, Ephesians 4.18. So they're continuing their state of death, even though they're physically alive. In fact, everyone who does not believe in Jesus will not see life because the wrath of God remains on him, John 3.36. And in 1 John chapter 3, even believers can be abiding in death when we are not living out our relationship with God in this life. So 
throughout the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, when we're referring to believers and unbelievers, death and life have nothing to do with existence. It's more than simple physical existence. God is far more concerned with our relationship with him, true life. And he urges us to run from true death, which is separation. Okay. And so what's interesting is that this state of death in which humans live, whether consistently or even believers abiding in death at different times of our, of our sinful lives, has not removed the image of God in us, has not demoted us from being God's images on this earth. After the flood, uh, God created a new command. He gave capital punishment for murder. And the reason for that, he says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, is the reason for capital punishment is because in the image of God, he made humans. We still carry the image of God, or we are the images of God in this world, even after the disaster of a world that prompted God to flood it. Okay, and so human life is precious to God. So, how does this link in with the doctrine of hell then? Okay, well, um, the Bible presents that there are uh, a human has at least two parts. Okay, now there's this big debate, you know, dry, dichotomy, trichotomy, multichotomy, you know, all sorts of things. And some people, physicalists, for instance, believe that everything is simply one part. We do not have a non physical spiritual part, just a physical part. We're just electrical impulses. And when we die, we're done. Okay, but the Bible offers no clear evidence for anything less than dichotomy. We have at least two parts, a material, physical, and a non-material or, or spiritual. Um, sometimes the scriptures, the soul, spirit, they sort of inter use those terms interchangeably, um, but they never do with body and soul or body and spirit. Okay, and in fact... At least nine people in the scriptures, Old and New Testament, now, at least nine people are described as being alive and conscious, not asleep, and certainly not non-existent, after their physical death. But before resurrection, Samuel was called up from the grave, remember, by Saul, the witch at Endor. The rich man, Lazarus, and Abraham all have conversation in the afterlife before they are resurrected. Now, some people think that is a parable. I don't, but some people do. But what about Moses and Elijah? Hearing with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're not just asleep, and they certainly did not cease to exist without having been resurrected. Jesus, of course, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 3, goes into the prison and preaches to the spirits that are in prison. And pretty much everybody sees that as after his death, okay, before his resurrection. And significantly, in Revelation 20, when Satan is cast into the lake of fire, a thousand years at the end of the, the, the millennial kingdom, before that, Antichrist and the false prophet, who are human, so images of God, image bearers of God, are cast into the lake of fire. A thousand years later, when Satan is cast there, when placed there for eternity, it says, where are the Antichrist and the false prophet are not were over a thousand years they have not been burnt up consumed okay so they are and in fact what we have what we find is that they are uh let me find this here they are um uh let me see <laughs> sorry uh um all unbelievers will join them, okay? And so it says, John John said that Satan, at least Satan and those two men, here's my point, Antichrist and a false prophet, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So even if someone does not want to believe that all people will, you know, be burnt up or, you know, be or last forever, they want people to be burnt up or, you know, be consumed and then cease to exist— we cannot deny that the doctrine of eternal conscious torment uh, is not in Scripture, or is in Scripture because at least two, and that's Antichrist and the false prophet, will be tormented day and night, forever and ever, okay? And what happens is when we die, 
uh, physically, we're told repeatedly that our, our non-physical parts go somewhere, whether to hell for this, this temporary holding place um, uh, where we find, again, the Samuel and we find uh, Moses and Elijah and we find uh, before, if you take, if you take this, this chasm in this Abraham's bosom or paradise or whatever, literally, okay, which we do, that there's a place where all departed people went before the cross. Now, some people think that Jesus emptied the paradise side. Again, we don't have time to get into all of those debates and discussions. But what we know today is that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is that believers go immediately into the presence of the Savior and he's in heaven. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we go directly there and we are with him. Paul, whenever he thought about dying, whenever he thought about heaven, it was about being with the Savior, not ceasing to exist, not um, sleeping. He used the term occasionally for sleep as a euphemism, but those who are asleep in Christ, but not a soul sleep, not a lack of consciousness. In Philippians chapter 1, he said, I would rather uh, die and be with Christ. That doesn't work if it's just a sleep or a, or a lack of existence. Um, he said, whether we are at home, 2 Corinthians 5, here on earth or at home in heaven, uh, he, he wanted his, you know, his aim is to please him. So he always looked about being with the Savior. So there's a lot more that we could go into that we could say about this. But in Revelation 19 and 20, and uh, Matthew 25, it talks about this place that was created, lack of the lake of fire, created for the devil and his angels, will have humans there as well. And there will be at least some humans that enter that lake of fire, not to be annihilated, but to exist in a state of separation from God and conscious torment and punishment for eternity. Okay. And so the promise of redemption is that a person who moves from their original position of rebellion against God into a position of submission to him is granted eternal life, not just living forever, but existing in a state of blessedness and perfection, a perfect relationship with God. The opposite of that is true. Those who choose to remain in rebellion against God will be granted eternal death, not cessation of existence, but existing forever in a state of punishment and torment separated from God. So to use the, the idea of die or to use the word die to mean a lack of existence, um, to, to cease to breathe is really short-sighted and it's not biblical. That's not typically how the biblical writers uh, used the term. Conditional immortality defines the second death in Revelation 20 as the cessation of existence. It proposes that when unbelievers are sent to the lake of fire, they'll be eventually consumed, cease to exist, and thus fulfilling their rebellious desire to be separated from God. And while that would satisfy the concept of separation, if you cease to exist, you're separated. <laughs> the scriptures go beyond just separation, adding to that death, eternal punishment and torment by creating us in his image and likeness as we sort of bring this to a, a, a conclusion, God designed us to represent him before all creation. In Romans 5, 12, the apostle Paul was clear that death was not a part of original creation. God warned Adam of it in Genesis 2, but it did not come into human existence until he sinned in Genesis 3. Had Adam not sinned, sin would not have entered. Adam would have lived forever to fulfill his mandate of ruling the world as God's perfect representative, his image. So the design for eternal existence of God's representatives is never rescinded in scripture. Sin didn't remove it. Physical death does not end it. In fact, we could go so far as to say God's design never fails, even if his creation doesn't fulfill it in the original way it was designed or the way God intended. For example, Satan was once a holy cherub tasked with covering God and his holiness. Uh, the Hebrew and Greek words, Satan or Satan and Satanas, respectively, um, of course, that's where we get his name or his title, both mean accuser, okay? Um, as a legal role, 
in a legal perspective, we would use the term prosecutor, the one who stands before the judge accusing those who break the law. And although he does it now in rebellion rather than in love and submission, this great prosecutor does continue to fulfill his role today by accusing those who are saved by the blood of Christ when we act out our sinfulness. In Revelation 12, John described him as standing before God day and night, accusing the brethren, acting in this prosecutorial role. But the same apostle, John, in 1 John chapter 2, wrote that when a believer does sin, we have an advocate, we have a defense attorney who stands with us on the other side before the Father. He's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ, the righteous one. And as much as Satan cannot escape his God-given design, neither can we. Those who come to faith in Jesus get to participate in representing him during this life to angels, to unbelievers, and to fellow believers. And this will continue into eternity, Revelation 22 says, when his servants will serve him and worship him in whatever roles he gives us. Likewise, those who have chosen to rebel against God must still fulfill their design. Everything that goes contrary to God's character is under his wrath, including those who choose to side with those things. This doesn't mean that they'll cease to exist. On the contrary, they'll serve forever as the perfect representation of the other side of God's holy justice, the side that punishes those who reject his eternal grace and mercy and choose to stand on their own. In Revelation 21 and 22, these are described as being outside of God's presence while those saved by grace are within it. No mention is made that this role will end. In fact, their existence in that state is presented in the same context as the eternality of the believer's existence. So, death, both physical and spiritual, is an anomaly. It was never intended for the human race. As God's images, we are created and designed to exist forever in God's service. Those who rebel against their maker will not escape that role but will fulfill it forever outside of his presence, consciously living out their eternal rebellion in punishment and torment. And that is what's called the second death. So there you go. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Daniel. That was excellent. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing or it's completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you bringing in uh, the the creation narrative into the discussion. Uh, the beginning and the end are very much linked. Uh, it's interesting. A lot of people that say we're crazy uh, for believing in the biblical account of creation will also say that we're crazy for believing in the biblical account of eternity. And those yep. who say we're crazy about believing in the biblical account for eternity think we're crazy for our belief in the origins. Yeah, but you're right. The first two chapters and the last two chapters of the Bible are, there's so many parallels there, yep. right? Um, and, and, and from Genesis 3 to Revelation 19 and 20 just really tells us the journey of how we get back to what God created and intended everything to be even if there are some casualties along the way, casualties being, again, separation, not lack of existence. True, true. Um, isn't it interesting that the, uh, the, the far side comics view of heaven, <laughs> which is, is rather common in Christianity, it's unfortunate. A lot of Christians have this idea that if you're good, it's never about faith in Christ. It's if you're good, then when you die, you will go to a cloud with a couple of wings you'll have a little harp and you'll you'll be there forever but the bible shows a completely different picture <laughs> god wants to be with us yeah you see that in the garden of eden yeah god walking in the cool of the day uh looking for for adam where are you right uh we see that in the end right god on the new earth right getting yeah. rid of this earth this one's broken <laughs> he's gonna yeah. give us a new one right he wants to be there with us well, Emmanuel, God with us, right? That's that's the design. It's always been about the relationship. And that's what always has. Why I think life is defined as relationship and death is defined as separation. Yeah. I have been reading a lot of uh, woke theology lately because that's what's 
penetrating evangelical thought. And if you've ever, uh, if you have never read woke theology, I can save you a lot of time and just tell you, bang your head against the wall. You'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's atrocious. Um, they, they completely redefined the, the purpose of the incarnation into an embodiment to, um, to bring in whatever particular uh, agenda the, the individual wokest has. Sometimes it's this race or that way, race or that particular yeah. sexual orientation. And they, they completely miss this, this grand narrative of God creating man, wanting to be with us, and the incarnation uh, contributing to that end so that for eternity we can be with God on the new earth. It's sad. Yeah. It's sad to see theologians going down that trail. And, and completely missing out. Uh, well, it's it's an ancient heresy, right? An yep, overemphasis yep. on humanity to the neglect of his deity. Uh, the church has been dealing with this from the very beginning, and we're not done yet. Uh, it's still it's still alive from the pit of hell. It is. It really is. Okay, this has been Daniel Geffrick speaking on the image of God and man. Thank you so much for uh, for teaching with us today. Thanks, Paul.